Ha. I'm not that famous, right? Um, okay, my name's Len. I'm from Cloud Africa. Thanks for accepting me. I think it's a fluke, but anyway. Um, before I jump into it, we run the ZA Dev Chat podcast up in Joburg, and we'd like to triple our subscriber base if all of you subscribe. Okay. So it's, it's for South Africans. We're interviewing South Africans a lot. Go listen to it. Uh, tell us what you think. Suggest new people who can come on the podcast. Okay, so um, just in the spirit of giving things back over lunch, some of the guys and I came up with a product idea that I just want to pitch to you quickly. We're like, what we're seeing is uh, a lot of photographers are going out of business because um, you know people have these amazing cameras and everything. But we think they're taking terrible photographs. So what we think is uh, selfies as a service would be like a really like, <laughs> you know, like it's a way to give back, you know, build it. Photographers could go around, get better selfies, right? So that's just a freebie. You go, somebody's going to build that, right? I'm sure. Think about it. OK. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of the other side of scaling, the non-technical stuff, like the things that get in the way. And, and we'll go into a bit of history. We'll have some tips. Uh, I'll actually recommend some books. And of course, a lot of this is just my opinion. So, you know, use it, don't use it. All right. Um, I'm not sure. It's coming. The slides are coming. Um, Quick question, who's built any hardware? Show of hands. Cool, like Arduinos and that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool, right? And isn't it interesting how easy that's getting these days? Go. Presentation. Aha. Does everybody know what that is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so a couple of years back, uh, Backblaze released the plans for this thing. It's pretty cool. And we, we thought, wow, that's amazing. We're, we're a cloud company, and we thought, let's build one of these things. And I had such an interesting experience. We literally downloaded these plans off the internet, emailed like some CAD drawings of metal boxes to some guy. Three days later, this box arrives. You know, got some drives, got a motherboard kind of stuck it all together. I mean, it, in the beginning, it was pretty like much duct tape, and we had uh, like actual bubble wrap underneath to keep the, the drives from like vibrating. It made a hell of a lot of noise the first time you switched it on with 45 drives in it. Um, <laughs> but we essentially built an 80 terabyte uh, storage enclosure. I think our cost was around 75,000 Rand. Now, if you try and, at that time, when you went to buy that from Dell or one of the vendors, it was crazy expensive. It was about three, 400,000 Rand. It was just really an eye-opener. And then we went nuts, and we said, cool, we're going to make this into an actual thing. And these little circuit boards at the bottom, we started to kind of fabricate them out, because the first version had all the wires going over the top, and we went into Internet Solutions for a demo, and it looked kind of weird, and the people were like, whoa, there's too many wires. Where, where are the flashing lights? Like, how do we know which drives aren't working? That kind of thing. So we, yeah, we thought we were geniuses, and we like designed a little circuit board at the bottom, which didn't work. It was crazy. It was, you know, like, why is it not working? Because the, the little tracks go around a corner, and it turns out that at the frequencies these uh, SATA buses are running at, that because the inside track is like just this tiny bit shorter, the timing signals on the disks wouldn't work. Uh, so we thought, oh, crap, like, this is never going to work. But we did a bit of Googling and found some guy in Singapore. We just emailed the circuit to him, and uh, he ran it through some testing that he had and fixed the circuit for us. So we came back, and there were little, like, bumps in the... Hello? Um, bumps in the circuit that then got the tracks to be the right length. And uh, I think that cost us 500 rand for that debugging session. So it was really kind of interesting that we were able to build like enterprise kind of class hardware at pretty much about a third of the cost. Um, of course, everybody freaked out. And one of the reasons they freaked out was we're not a name brand vendor. 
okay, which kind of leads into what I want to talk about today is uh, this, this kind of obsession with vendors and things. But as I said, we've got some tips, and one of the first tips I want to give you is if you do any kind of storage work and you can use ZFS, like just use it. It's really great. We had so many problems until we switched to ZFS. ZFS has saved us. In Cloud Africa, we haven't lost any customer data in five years now, even though hard drives fail on a fairly regular basis. Okay, so I just want to give you guys some context for what I'm talking about, and we're going to go back to the olden days. Does anybody remember IBM? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, they've been around. Interestingly, over 100 years old, like a, quite an interesting company. But just to preempt that, have you guys first book tip? Have you guys read this book? Anybody seen this book? Fascinating book. Go and read it. One of the, one of the opening chapters, the guy talks about how in the very, very first days, people were building like these super large, uh, primarily military applications using computers. And... Um, of course, the, 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 you couldn't just go buy a computer, right? You had to actually build a computer while you were building a language and some software and all sorts of stuff. And these projects that he describes in the beginning of this book were just insane. They had probably a thousand people working for two or three years to build one computer system with one application on it. And you think of that in today's... Um, Context. That's like 3,000 man years to build a system, right? That's just insane. And, and coming out of that, a lot of the like fundamentals of what a software project was and how to build software and hardware were, were sort of established. They gave some, some presentations. I think it was the US Navy gave some early presentations, which you know, people wanted to know, how did you build the system? And they said, well, you have a plan. <laughs> and then you build hardware. And then you write code before the hardware arrives, and then when the hardware arrives, you just type it in. It was this interesting process. Uh, <laughs> in those days, programmers were literally people who typed in the stuff that had been pre-written out on these big cards. Um, so yeah, maybe that's where a bit of that illusion comes from. But anyway, going forward a few years, so IBM, and, and it's a super interesting history if you guys want to go back and read it. Uh, go and have a read up on where the mainframe came from uh, and, and how IBM built it. So way back in 1964, IBM announced this thing called the IBM 360. It was, it was just huge at the time. It's really hard to explain how big this was and, and like what a revolution it was. Um, and they sold this thing right the way up until 1978. And you could pretty much do everything on this computer. And it was kind of a modular system. You could add disks and extra processors. And, um, it was pretty much the birth of, of what we did. And IBM was just rocking. I mean, they were making so much money. It was, it was awesome. They were, the, they were the kings of everything. They weren't apparently a very particularly interesting company to deal with. They were very much, you did things the IBM way, and that's how it worked. Okay. Um, interestingly, they, they had virtualization back then. So they were able to change like underlying parts of the hardware, and you just kept running the same application code. The compiled application code ran against different hardware architectures. It was like super interesting. Um, and they were really the only kid on the block. Um, as I said, go, go have a read on how they, they pretty much bet the entire company on building the mainframe in the first place. I think they took like a, an enormous loan to build it. They took all the money they'd built. And you can imagine what a risk this was for a company that at that time was pretty much 60 years old. Um, okay. All right. So the story continues. There was this guy. And he... He worked at IBM at the time. He was one of the, the people who actually built the 360, and he became known as, or he became one of the IBM fellows. So in IBM, the, the fellows kind of run IBM. They're the, the technical thought leadership of IBM. So he was, he was a really serious guy in IBM. But um, he had a bunch of radical ideas, and I think they, you know, they, they ended up struggling with each other quite a lot. And he left... Uh, he left IBM. So you can, 
You can see the context for this. This is, he's like an early startup kind of dude. Doesn't look like it. He still had the suit and everything, but uh, yeah. Um, I think he was 92 when this picture was taken. He was a very serious character. But he left and he, he got some funding from Fujitsu. And what he said was cool. Um, well, it's just an interesting quote from this guy. I'll give you a moment to, to read through that. I think it talks to the heart of a lot of why we, why we leave these big enterprises and want to like go out on our own and create cool stuff. You know, basically he did not want to get stuck in a box or like be this like sort of uh, peg in a hole. Like he said, cool, he'd, he'd, he'd do great stuff at IBM, but that was it. That was what he was going to do. So he went off, created this Amdahl Corporation. Basically, what he did was. You can see this is the precursor to PCs, right? He, he cloned the mainframe. He said, cool, that IBM mainframe, I've got one. And it was literally a plug and play compatible thing. You could go to Amdahl and you could buy a mainframe and you could just copy all your software across. And, and it, was a, it was truly disruptive because it was less expensive. It was way less expensive than IBM. So IBM was making so much money off the mainframes, it wasn't even funny back then. I mean, they were just so huge. Um, and, and he just said, cool, here we go, buy, buy my machine. So really like a classic startup kind of guy. And uh, off you go. Except IBM noticed this guy. So this guy started taking, a, <laughs> you know, it came down to the money, right? He, started, he took a billion dollars from IBM. And of course, I'm sure somebody at IBM was like, hmm, this has got to stop, right? We've got to stop this guy somehow. But how do, you, how do you stop this guy? He's got a better product, it's cheaper, does exactly what your product does. So what, you know, what are you going to do? Aha. So you can't, you can't go head to head with this guy because the customers are going to go, well, if I'm comparing figures for figures, I'm going to go with this Amdahl guy. So. Some, I don't know who it was, some evil marketing genius in IBM like entered the picture at this point. And my theory is that he changed the way we, we tackle big projects forever. Because what he did was he came up with this idea. The IBM salesman would go to customers and they'd say, well, you want to buy that guy's mainframe. It's not a good idea. They'll say, why? I said, well, you know, he's this little startup guy, man. You want to come with IBM, we've got support, we're, we're good guys. He's, you know, he's a fly-by-night kind of guy. You know, they, they really played him down and they, they coined this idea of FUD, or fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And they instilled that idea in the minds of customers. They made customers really nervous about like, kind of leaving IBM. Okay. And it was, it was, it's pure genius, right? You can't go anywhere. Who, whoever got fired for buying IBM? You know, those kind of ideas. This is, this is where it came from back in the day. Okay. It's interesting stuff, right? So this stuff really became a trend. In fact, Microsoft kind of copied this marketing technique almost verbatim. Um, and, and anybody who went up against Microsoft, they, they kind of lost out, especially at the enterprise level. It, the IBM's kind of pet idea backfired on them with OS2. Do you guys remember OS2? It was like this technically better thing, you know? But Microsoft used that fear, uncertainty, and doubt kind of idea to go, well, do you want to go with this old company? They just turned the tables on IBM, right? And said, ah, oh, they're old, man. They're dying. Come with the new cool stuff. But we're, we're a good company too, so go with us. And, um, I'm an old guy now, and uh, I've, I've seen this like two or three times around, and I think it's kind of embedded in software these days that people market in this way. All right, so let's just, uh, let's just think about it for a second here. So what is, is any hands up who's been scared of making a decision about committing to a new platform or a new piece of technology? You know, honestly, like, yeah, you know, it's true, it's out there. I think we don't talk about it much, but this is a very real thing. 
And, and the vendors know this. The vendors are going to like use that against you often when you're trying to buy stuff. You know, I, I can't mention too many names because some of them are here. <laughs> so an unpleasant emotion caused by the threat of danger, pain, or harm. You know, it's kind of like, it could be really embarrassing that you said, let's go with this product and it doesn't work out, you know. I mean, some people are, are kind of coated in Teflon, I've seen, and they're able to avoid this and make bad decisions all the time and things fail. But, you know, it's kind of normal for software to fail, apparently. Um, so I, I think it's a very natural thing. People prey on that. We get scared of making these decisions. It's very hard to, to avoid that. I think if we're conscious, though, we may have a chance. Uncertainty. This is kind of an interesting one, right? Not able to be relied on, not known or definite, an uncertain future. When I read that, I mean, these are the, the actual definitions from the dictionary. When I read that, I thought, that seems like software development. <laughs> kind of matches my experience, right? <laughs> that's, our, that's, that's the project plan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if, you, um, if you're into all that lean stuff, and especially like the Eastern thinking about it, software development is essentially unknowable in the future. You know, it's, it's non-deterministic. You can't know what's going to happen. So to me, like that feeling of uncertainty, embrace it. That's your normal, like, that's the normal way things go. I didn't make this up, seriously. It came from the dictionary. <laughs> Who can doubt the value and necessity of these services? <laughs> yeah, so maybe you need this database service, you know? You should go with the big vendor, right? You shouldn't install some open source stuff. Uh, who came through the like Microsoft years and the battle with open source? Show of hands there. Yeah, for the guys of you who haven't put your hands up, talk to one of the people who put their hands up. It was a real battle, you know. Netscape disappeared like pretty much overnight. You know, I tried to in those days use Postgres or MySQL in clients and wow, it was a real fight. I see it everywhere these days. I see this FUD everywhere. Their name brands. Like, are you cool? Are you doing the cool thing? What do you mean you're not using Mongo? <laughs> and, uh, it's like, come on. <laughs> yeah, mean stack, right? Conventions, standards. I mean, I, I did a lot of consulting with customers and like, standards, man, is this thing standards compliant? You know? It's like a project that, I mean, we were talking to somebody yesterday over lunch, like a project that would take like three months, say from beginning to end, ends up taking a year because we just want to make sure it's standards compliant and it meets all the right like, things. And, you know, you, do you have the right coding conventions? Who, who's ever come across this build versus buy argument? Yeah, especially in the enterprise, it's pervasive, right? I mean, and, and what's the answer? Should you build or should you buy? Hands up for build. Whoa, hands up for buy? You guys are in trouble, man. And, and I think the, the underlying thought behind a lot of this marketing stuff, it's also reasonable. You, know, it's, you, you shouldn't do something you're scared of, right? Fear is a normal human response. Like if you do mountaineering or climbing, uh, if you stop being scared of heights, you should probably stop climbing, right? Because <laughs> fear is this natural kind of limiting factor to what you can expose yourself to. And, and I think that's kind of been misused a lot with selling us these things. And I think it leads to this real problem. You know, once, you, once you buy into this stuff, you end up losing control over what it is that you're building. You know, somebody else has now got control over the core of your financial applications, your services. You know, you've got this fancy service bus or whatever it is. Something's orchestrating your environment. But it's not yours. And at the end of the day, the vendors have a thousand customers. You need feature X. They're only going to build it if 
most of their customers want it, right? Your, your interests aren't exactly aligned. And the trouble is you don't have any control. You can't fix it. You can't go into the TIBCO service bus or whatever. There's no one from TIBCO here, right? Cool. Um, we may have to edit the video. Um, yeah, so you end up losing control, and I think that's a really dangerous thing, especially when you're trying to scale, right? Because there, there are some things we do know about the future. We don't know exactly how it's all going to turn out, but there are some things that we do know, and often we know that we're going to circle back to some functionality we built in the beginning of a project and want to extend it or something. And if that piece of functionality is not ours, we end up in a kind of tight place. Who, who builds with frameworks here, just to show hands? Ah, yeah, right. It's the same danger, right? You've let go of a certain locus of control to the framework. Who's ever like, had to open up framework code? Yeah, yeah, you know. So maybe it got you a little bit faster in the beginning, but actually when you're in the heat of things, that framework doesn't really help you all the time. So you heard it here first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, w I was trying to, uh, I was doing a little bit of a course teaching some guys Golang, and I wanted to show them the language. And all they wanted to do was write tests first. <laughs> I was like, guys, like, you know, we'll, we'll do tests later. No, it's TDD. You've got to write the tests first. It's like, oh, you don't even know the language. Like, you know, <laughs> so, like, like what, what are you going to do, you know? So we, we end up spending half the course showing them how to write tests. You know? It's a very weird way to learn the language. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think we just spoke about that. So I'm definitely, in, in my world, I like libraries over frameworks, just as a way to think about it. I like code that I can, that, that's almost subservient to the code I'm writing, so I can use it. But that code doesn't dictate how I write my code. Yeah. Does that make sense? And the key point is that as you grow, as you add more stuff, I mean, I think the guy from Spree was saying this morning, um, Etsy yesterday, why didn't somebody mention, why didn't they go get ETL tools? Why did they write it in PHP? Hey, they wanted control. They, they knew how that worked. It's a, in, in a way, it's a safer place. So just some like, things to think about is if you're suffering from like, the wrong kind of fear. I mean, there's a healthy kind of fear, right? But there's also the wrong kind of fear. So hands up, who's changed the language halfway through a project? Yeah. <laughs> what? It's impossible. You've got to have a meeting about that. <laughs> Which may lead to other meetings. Meetings, it's like a virus. Yeah. Once you're infected, like, you have to have more of them. Yeah, I mean, so, so DSLs have been around for a while, but who's ever, like, actually written a new DSL for their system, you know? One or two people. Once you've done it once, that's a cool thing to do, you know? But it's a kind of hard pitch, and you can, you can see it in your mind when you go to the, the boss, the pointy-haired boss, and say, listen, we need to write a new language. It's like, well, what's wrong with C Sharp and Java? <laughs> so don't get me started, yeah. This is an interesting one. So when you hire people in your organization, what are you looking for? When you put that uh, kind of request for CVs out, do you say, I'm looking for Java enterprise people, .NET experience, must know the mean stack, right? <laughs> we don't want to hire non-hipster people here. No. <laughs> yeah. Got to know AWS, got to know Oracle. Or are you trying to hire smart people who get things done? Yeah. I would say if you're trying to hire against specific tool sets, you've bought into that fear-based mentality around this stuff. And when that, when that crunch comes and you realize you should actually be writing in Lisp, you're not going to do it. Because Lisp's so weird, man. 
even though it's like half as long and twice as fast. Oh my God, there are no tests. Somebody yesterday was saying, like, we can't do that. You can't just, like, ship to production. What about all the testing? Yeah? It's kind of lack of, that's, that's a kind of example of doubt, right? I mean, you wrote this code, now you've got to write more code to check that the code you wrote. But what about the tests? Who's testing the tests? <laughs> Where does it end? It ends on a beach with no shoes. Yeah, I mean, are you standards compliant? For goodness sake, man. Stop inventing new protocols. Look, I know they're better, but really, XML's fine. <laughs> what is wrong with XML? In fact, XML looks like Lisp. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, have you got the right processes and procedures in place? I mean, that ties into a whole bunch of stuff around, like methodologies, right? Got to have a methodology. Can't just go write code and get stuff done. It's not okay. <laughs> it's true. I spend weeks figuring this stuff out. So, two of the guys I work with up in Joburg, and I know them, we had them on the podcast, go listen to the podcast, um, have come up with this idea called the spine model. And, and I think it's really cool. You should go check it out. It's really a very interesting way to think about things. So who knows uh, extreme programming? Anybody practiced extreme programming? Kind of a little bit. So extreme programming talks about values, principles, and practices. It's their core kind of way to look at software projects. And what, uh, what Donnie and Kevin have put together is They've added in the, the needs at the top and the tools at the bottom, and these arrows are quite interesting. So one of the things we've been talking about the last few days, see a lot of the presentations have been around tools, right? Like what tools am I using? I'm doing this in PHP. Oh, we shouldn't use that tool. We should use the other tool. How many debates have you been in where you, what you've actually been doing is debating tools, right? Like do, who uses Jira? Yeah. It's terrible, right? <laughs> it's like such a bad... No, it's not. It's fine, but it's just a tool. Tools are like, in this model, tools are at the bottom of the stack. They're the least important thing. Languages, tools, databases, who cares? What's most important is what do you need out of this stuff? If you don't have a need, you're not going anywhere. Um, and, and if you go look at the spine model itself, is what they'll say is that like kind of new people tend to approach problems at the bottom two rungs. You know, what, what bug tracker are you using? And, and what are your practices? Oh, we use Git and we use Git flow. Okay, that's how it works, yeah. <laughs> Got to do branching, blah. Why do you need that? That's always a good question. Like, why, you know, it helps you to put the context back. What do we value in our system? Uh, when, when the presentation from Etsy yesterday, coders craft, like values were important. Hello. Um, they, they're like a, what I need is for the projector to stay on. Uh, so to me, this is a really nice way of reframing um, decisions and conversations around tools, vendors, and whatever. It's, uh, who, who goes to the vendors with the actual needs. You know, that's what you should do, right? Um, instead, we, we end up like getting three tool vendors in a room and saying, fight it out, guys. You know, show me who's got the stuff to become my supplier of choice kind of thing. Um, second book tip. Do you guys know this book? It's a really, really interesting book. So this guy, Steve McConnell, I worked at Microsoft, and I don't know if he didn't have anything to do or he got bored or whatever, but he went off and he studied about 60 projects and just made notes like, what are people doing? What's happening? Are you late? Are you early? How much money did you spend? And then he collected all this data back from these 60 projects and wrote a book about it. And like, for example, one of the things he talks about is, is classic mistakes that people make. And he's got a whole kind of chapter on classic mistakes. Things like um, 
and put your hands up if these have happened to you. Adding people to a project when it's late. Yeah. Oh, it's like, we've only got a month left. Can we get two more guys on the project? You know, and it doesn't work, right? Because you've got to now skill up those people on the project, and that takes away from the team that's already focused. Uh, gold plating requirements. You know, we're like, you know, you're not going to get anything. So what you ask for is the rainbow, and uh, you know, you might only get a sandwich. Yeah. So that's a great tip. Go read that. And subscribe to the podcast if I haven't mentioned that. <laughs> okay, thanks. You're awesome humans. And there's a good quote. What you needed was the web was the projector stay on. The tool you were using was Google Docs Presenter. That's why. No, it's this <laughs> Mac. It's this Mac. Ah. Yeah. Instead of the Ubuntu laptop that wouldn't work with the projector. <laughs> <laughs> good point, good point. Who's got a question? Yeah. Bob. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, great. Great talk, quite interesting. So, I actually, Thanks. one of my friends in the UK asked, so what are you running for ZFS? Solaris, FreeBSD, Linux? Sorry, what? Um, uh, so, so, what OS are you running your ZFS stuff on? Uh, Illumos. Yeah, SmartOS. So, yeah. Either that or BSD, but sure. Yeah. I think Bridget wants to know why you call it ZFS. Because it can lock ZFS. It, it, oh, right. <laughs> it's like that accent thing, right? Because yeah. it can like store a zettabyte, man. Zettabyte. You say zettabyte, I say zettabyte. I actually am interested in, I'm, well, I'm interested in everything you said, but I'm interested in the Illumos smart OS thing. So do you just miss open Solaris or you love Joyent or like what's, what's going on there? Tell us about your choices. I'm interested. Um, well, I'm a kind of systems guy from the beginning, so I like real operating systems. <laughs> 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 and um, yeah, <laughs> so you, you kind of get used to like, the elegance of a real Unix. Uh, things, things work properly. They were thought out by Ken Thompson and like all his mates, and it, it's just really clean. Uh, you know, Linux has been fantastic, but, and please don't let my car tires down or anything. Linux is broken. You know, they, they, I mean, they have so many kernel regressions. It's, it's a problem. Why, why can't they get ZFS in Linux, you know, really? ZFS, okay. Like, why not? Why is, why is the networking stack so broken in Linux? I mean, NetFilter or something is supposed to have been there for like five years now. The guy left in disgust because of some politics and infighting. I, mean, I forget who it was, that girl last year who just left the Linux world. Whoa. <laughs> it's, it's a Mac. It's not know. quite Unix. <laughs> it's yeah. got a mock kernel. Um, I've got a question, um, you, if I'm allowed. Um, these are real shoes, yes. <laughs> could teach me about your ways. Um, it's, actually, uh, it's actually related to teaching. How often, when you said, like, when young developers come in, they gra gravitate towards tools, how do you think we should be talking about what we do in a way that encourages people to talk about needs first instead of tools? Well, I mean, so the spine model is pretty deep in that regard because it's, um, it cuts across development, project management, uh, oops, fast fingers. Um, but I think it's really important to try and like go into a meeting and people are talking about that stuff, just say, well, what do you need? What you need isn't Jira or who knows what bug tracking. You know, you know, what you need is a ticketing system. Well, why do you need a ticketing system? So that you can have 
put all the tickets in there and ignore them, right? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? The conversation gets interesting. Like, but no, what do you actually need? Well, I don't like being woken up in the middle of the night by tickets landing, like from, you know. Okay, well, what do you actually need? And you can kind of go around that till you find something really concrete. Yeah. Where, like, what, what are your values? Like, uh, who, who's been on on-call rotations? Who, any ops guys here, you know? Do you like it? No, it's not great. So what I need is the system to not, like, alert me when it can deal with that stuff itself. Like, you know, only one alerts when, yeah, I think, so I value my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Especially as an ops guy, like, I really value my sleep. The third day I've been awake in a row, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. Thank you for ZFS, though. Um, yeah, so that's an important question. Any other questions, guys? Last chance. Cool. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn.